King uh, pretty decent size. Uh, we have about 43,000 students. And plus we have, uh, you know, I think 10,000 students, uh, they're they get, they getting online degrees. Uh, some of them are full-time, part-time. Uh, my department uh, has about 1,900 students. As you can see, about uh, 1,550 undergrad and, and rest of them are graduate students. Uh, we are one of the largest departments in the engineering uh, because we are mechanical and aerospace combined, just like yours. Uh, we have about 50 faculty members. And uh, we have a very, I think, uh, nice uh, kind of topical areas we cover. And uh, now let's uh, maybe go back to what I intend to talk today. Uh, something uh, related to uh, injury uh, of the brain. Okay, and I'll try to uh, make a point that the, the research area that we are trying to cover, uh, well, the rational behind it, okay? So I think in the simplest uh, perspective, uh, what we are trying to capture is, as you can sense, you know, if uh, head is being impacted by any kind of traumatic forces, right? Uh, it could be concussion or even from blast or, or whatever form. Uh, if the, the impact is severe enough, we know that it can lead to injury, right? And, and of course, uh, the biggest challenge is involved the human head uh, to predict the injury or assess of okay, what kind of traumatic force will cause injury so that we can, we can uh, address these issues and maybe try to prevent it. Uh, that's very challenging just because it involves human subjects, right? So, uh, I think most research has been done on this uh, field involves complications or involves, uh, you know, uh, some uh, alternative uh, experiments because we cannot directly test human subjects. And so the, the aspect that we follow is, is heavily computations, but we do some supporting experiments. And we, uh, the mission is the same. We want to capture or, the, or the predict the injury risk, okay? Uh, because it's very, uh, as I'm trying to give the picture, the, the brain is such a complex, uh, you know, material, if you look at from the material point of view, and the modality of, of getting the injury is so various, and so many ways it can happen, that I think, uh, uh, you know, pinpointing exactly what cause will lead to what effect is, is nearly impossible. So the uh, goal would be, uh, in, in my perspective, is to find out what is the high probability of, of kind of uh, injury, rather than saying this is going to be injury. And of course, uh, when the force is severe enough, we know that it will definitely cause a, a, a quantitative injury. I think the point I want to make when the, the applied force is a little bit subtle, not severe enough, but not also low enough, in that case, how do you really uh, do injury uh, risk predictions. And of course, it needless to say, uh, TBI is, is a serious you know, uh, health issue. So I think everyone, uh, nearly one part of all injuries that happens you know, is, is related to TBI. And that involves uh, the community, uh, the civilian community, the military community, even you know, uh, issues uh, that happens uh, due to domestic issues. You can even get uh, TBI and the consequence is even more serious than the injury itself because it involves a long process to uh, you know treat this issue. And and in the military uh, is is also a very very major concern. Of course, uh, army I think uh, takes the uh, biggest share of this uh, injury because of their presence and, and activities. Uh, and and of course all sectors of the I think Department of Defense uh, and the defense community military community it is a, a, a concern and uh, uh, of course the nature of my research uh, as it is uh, heavily funded from the Department of Defense I think uh, some of the work I uh, focus more that uh, probably serves more than it is mission I mean uh, because of this uh, funding I get from the Department of Navy. Or the Office of Naval Research, uh, maybe some of this aspect that we focus uh, start their mission over the global mission, but in general, TBI is a serious, serious concern, right? All right, so uh, I want to bring uh, this uh, or break down this TBI event uh, 
I think two distinct, although there are three images here. One is uh, the A, as you can see, is the penetrating, penetrating injury. Something has to uh, go through uh, the skull and, and go to the, uh, enter the inside. And you know, we can imagine the scenario like this uh, of almost exclusively will be very lethal and, and uh, definitely a very serious matter. The, the category B and C that we are showing here is uh, due to you know, blunt impact, uh, or, or, or we also call it concussion. And another is also you know, uh, due to acceleration and deceleration. That is also can be caused by impact or could be blast wave exposure. But the main difference is in that case, the head will go for you know, a back and forth motion and in this case, maybe the, the head is stationary, but the object will be, will be impacting it. In both cases, uh, uh, the, the injury uh, has a very distinct features and, and depending on the impact force, uh, injury could be different, right? So this animation will show you that because our brain inside the skull is kind of a floating in a medium, as we have this uh, you know, uh, acceleration and deceleration that happens, uh, due to this repeated motion, the brain tissue itself actually goes back and forth. And, and as you can see, this highlighted uh, area uh, experience uh, repeated compression and expansion force, right? And I'm going to tell you maybe many times, but our brain tissue is a very unique uh, kind of collective you know, material system. It has a bulk modulus is about two gigapascal but the, the shear modulus is about only two kilopascals. So it's one million times difference in the material properties. It contains 75% water, which makes this material very much red dependent. You know, they, they respond uh, due to uh, loading rate uh, aggressively. At the same time, their shear modulus is so low. So their deformation in the shear due to shear is way severe than the deformation due to uh, this kind of uh, uh, hydrostatic forces, right? So keeping that in mind, I think many, many uh, brain injury risk uh, prediction criteria has been actually uh, been proposed. This, I think uh, back in uh, 1960s, uh, this is, uh, I think, proposed. Uh, the first one is of this kind is called the head injury risk assessment criteria or AAP. That takes into account the linear acceleration of the head that goes back and forth. And how long this, you know, the, it is exposed to this kind of uh, acceleration phase, and this formula gives you a number called, uh, you know, injury risk number. For example, uh, if p is equal to one thousand, that means you will have ninety percent probability of, of this skull fracture, right? So this criteria has been developed by uh, conducting many, many experiments in, in involving, you know, uh, inbound, I think, um, cadaver. Uh, so, so that they, they only pinpoint what caused the skull fracture, because uh, in, in that time it was found that 80% of the you know uh, traumatic injury involved the skull fracture, some level of the skull fracture, right? So this uh, this theory is very much widely used in in the automobile uh, automobile industry even as of today, because it, it is simple. You capture the uh, uh, the motion uh, using some sensors, and that way you can uh, pinpoint what uh, is uh, leading to injury, right? So this is a typical, you know, uh, uh, application of this head injury criteria. Uh, you can see that you can uh, find out the speed, uh, I mean, the acceleration in terms of G. So that is the vertical column. And then how long it is being exposed. And the time you can see is in terms of milliseconds. That means it's a very short duration, but uh, within this duration, if uh, uh, anything uh, falls in the green zone, it's okay. But if it falls in the pink zone, that means it's not okay. That's how this uh, head injury criteria is being assessed for the whole head as a whole, right? Uh, one criti criticism for this uh, model is uh, this doesn't take into account uh, rotational acceleration at all. And uh, uh, I'm going to show uh, you, uh, I, I already told so much about this brain tissue is so much uh, susceptible to shear deformation and rotation leads to shear. So that kind of, you know, mechanisms of injuries kind of, in, kind of ignored in this model, right? So then over the time, many other models have been proposed. I think one of them is used the so-called Gambit model that actually takes into account the uh, rotational and linear acceleration both together 
and, and also uh, uh, give you a, a index and you can decide what is uh, the probability of uh, you know, injury. So these, and there are many other, I think few other uh, form of the model uh, are there, but the basic idea is the same. You, you track down the motion and then use this motion information, motion in terms of acceleration, linear or rotational, and use this motion information to predict the injury risk. Okay, so it doesn't take into account really the you know interior deformation or or strain and and the forces produced in the tissue itself, uh, but takes into the into account the motion itself. Okay, and uh, obviously uh, as uh, uh, brain tissue can. Uh, Injured in many different ways, uh, this kind of motion based theories have limitations. It just cannot capture all aspects of injuries, right? So that's why over time, uh, I think uh, uh, other injury risk uh, predictions criteria like the tissue level criteria and, and even cellular level criteria has been kind of being evolved or being, uh, being proposed. So I think to get that kind of tissue theories or, or cellular level theories, maybe it's, it's not a bad idea to take a look about the brain tissue itself, right? So uh, at the macroscopic level, you can see this, uh, you know, we, we know the brain tissue is kind of a, a, a broken down into two uh, big components, this uh, gray matter and the white matter. And, and, and most of the gray matter actually exist in the uh, skull area, as you can see, it, because of their kind of complexion, a little bit darker than the white matter, they call it gray, but uh, uh, they are kind of lined up in the outer uh, surface of the brain tissue and the most of the interior uh, brain tissue is made of white matter. The, the, the presence of fatty, I think fats uh, is, is one of the myelium uh, seeds and, and other uh, entities actually make this uh, white metal look uh, a little bit lighter. But if you now break down this white metal and gray metal even a little bit higher resolution, and you'll, you'll start to see even more detail the structure of the brain tissue. For example, you can see that the, the gray matter actually is, you know, consists of the so-called the cortical column. This is basically highly parallel, uh, uh, several billions of neurons packed together to give you very, very anisotropic uh, uh, properties of the brain tissue in this area, okay? So this uh, color map that you are seeing basically reflects the different structural features of this neuron cells, uh, but it is obvious that these neuron cells are highly oriented, highly anisotropic, and this is the kind of, you know, uh, uh, attributes of this uh, gray matter. Another part of these uh, 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 neurons that exist in this gray matter, this neuron doesn't have any uh, outside cushion. We call it the myelian seed. So they are very, very much bare, and, and, uh, and um, this is how they are kind of uh, architecture, right? And, and the white matter, the building block is so-called the fiber tract. You can see this, this fiber tract are also fiber-like entities, uh, but uh, uh, contains this myelian seed, and they're also highly oriented, okay? And, and that's how basically the entire brain tissue is being composed. Now, if you look even one scale down, you will be able to, you will start to see the individual neural cells, right? And our brain has, I think, over 100 billion neural cells and also equal, almost equal number of glial cells. I think these are the two building blocks that uh, uh, constitute the brain tissue itself. Okay? And, and so if we look at the neural cells from the uh, white matter part and for the gray matter part, you can see that the basic difference is the white matter has this you know, a myelin seed layers, outer shell, but the gray, you know, gray matter neuron doesn't have that, okay? But interior structure of the neuron cell and overall structure other than this myelin seed is the same. So in other words, if you think about the, you know, neuron in the gray matter, that will not have this, you know, uh, uh, kind of coverings or the, or, the, or the shell outside, but it will have uh, the so-called cell body, then it will have the uh, synaptic terminals, and the long fiber that is called the exon, okay? 
Okay. And now if you look even more closely, the exon is, itself actually is very much like a composite material. It has uh, those cytoskeleton uh, elements called microtubule, uh, the tau protein, and the neurofilament. These are all fiber-like material gives you very much directional properties. And then you, have, you can see that they are also highly distributed, okay? Uh, very, very, I think, uh, detailed, and, and kind of homogeneous distribution of those uh, fiber-like materials. And these outer shell is the myelin seed that, that is present in the uh, white matter, okay? And this is about 500 nano, nanometer uh, uh, thick. Okay, so this is how a single neuron look like. Now, if I look at this multi-scale structure, right, uh, of this uh, brain tissue, you can see that uh, at the macroscopic scale, we have the head and the in the single brain tissue. But if I break down to, uh, you know, uh, over the over the smaller scale, higher resolution, you can see that there are few uh, very distinct structural features exist at exist at different scales. Right? We have the fiber tract and the cortical column that shows the kind of structural features of collection of neurons. If you go down uh, even higher resolution, you will started to see and the single neuron and then single neuron have at least two distinct attributes when it is present in the white matter and when it is present in the gray matter. Now, if you go to the subcellular level, like single exon and interior, uh, definitely you will start to see all those detailed, uh, you know, uh, cytoskeleton elements. So when it comes to, comes to damage, right? If you, for the time being, if we just consider uh, brain tissue as in just a, multi-scale material, right? Uh, if we want to find out what will lead to, let's say a failure of this, you know, uh, let's say multi-scale material, you can, you can easily see the, the possibilities are countless, right? It can happen to the structural level, it can happen to the cellular level, even it can happen to this subcellular level. So unless we can have some understanding about those different modalities of damage, then it is very difficult to predict the injury of this brain if we consider it a brain damage, right? So I think that's <clears throat> my vision and my group has been working to look at the, the aspects of damage or injury of the brain tissue at the very small scale, starting from the subcellular scale and kind of going up to the to the uh, in a bottom-up approach uh, to to match it with the uh, injury that can uh, can be detected from the uh, macroscopic scale. Okay, so in a nutshell, I think the brain injury before we want to predict the brain injury risk, uh, this injury risk prediction can be categorized into three aspects. Right, one is the so-called head injury criteria. This is predominantly motion based, right? So you capture the acceleration or deceleration data and predict well, what is the probability of brain injury. The tissue level injury basically consider the, the stress or the deformation in terms of the strain and uh, uh, produced in the brain tissue. And then you predict what is the uh, probability of failure, right? And of course, because it involves constitutive properties, uh, definitely it is heavily computational because uh, you know, doing experiments involving uh, living tissue is not possible. And rate is very important parameter here because of the nature of the brain tissue. It is a viscoelastic material. It is 75% fluid and, and it has a very low shear modulus than the bulk modulus, a classical attributes of a, of a kind of viscoelastic material. So the rate is also a very important parameter, right? At the cellular level, we look at the same aspects, but we try to completely ignore or overlook the stress part. The reason being uh, uh, quantifying uh, the stress requires a detailed understanding of the constitutive law, like the modulus. And these kind of properties are very ill-defined uh, because of the nature of this tissue itself. And, and so many possibilities. So it is, I think, a more uh, practical approach to capture the deformation because this kind of uh, uh, features can be monitored using imaging technologies or maybe other resources. So for a given head motion that happens to the head, we can possibly detect deformation more 
uh, I think precisely then try to address what stress is being developed inside. So that's one of the ideas behind looking at the deformation more uh, than, the, than the stress measures. Anyway, so now my, my goal is to connect the, the head level motion and to see how this motion being transmitted to the interior of the brain all the way to the cellular level and so that we can capture what is happening at the cellular level and, and can we really capture any, any uh, damage uh, through our computations and some of them could be validated through uh, experiments done at that level. Okay, so that's kind of overall vision I have. And uh, one paper I'd like to highlight, this is a very recent paper uh, by a group in, in KTH. Uh, uh, they try to capture the head motion and the corresponding tissue stresses, including the stresses that is being developed and stresses and deformation being developed also at the cellular level. So this is a very detailed, high fidelity finite element model. You can see that that includes the skull, the detailed structure of the brain tissue, and also the orientation of this exon fiber. So I think this is one of the few studies that I, I, I really you know, find it very exciting that includes the, uh, the model of the skull, the, the, the brain tissue, and also the exon fiber. So that way we can see some, uh, you know, uh, we can make some observation that how the motion is being transmitted to the tissue level and also the cell level. And is there any uh, uh, relation or difference, right? So uh, the input force or input uh, here is the uh, translation and ac linear acceleration and the rotational acceleration, right? It is being subjected from uh, three different directions, as you can see through this color map. And the value of this linear acceleration and then rotational accelerations are taken from the database from the American College of Football Player. I think there is a database there. And the value of those accelerations are chosen. That actually was found, uh, was leading to unconsciousness, right? So any football player became unconscious. I think their helmet is mounted with sensors. So they record this critical acceleration data, both linear and rotational. And those data are being used here in this study. And another aspect is uh, this study involves different, you know, uh, brain tissue size, female and, and male and larger, small, and many different varieties, at least six different varieties. So the effect of size also being at this. But the more important part is through this, uh, you know, analysis, one thing is obviously observed because of this head motion, the strain that is being developed in the tissue level and the strain that is developed in the uh, uh, exon level are, are different. They are not same, right? So uh, uh, you look at from the white matter for uh, corpus callosum and any other uh, areas of the brain, no matter where you look, this top row is the tissue strain. This is the uh, cell level strain. You can definitely see the, there is difference. So uh, that tells us that, you know, one size fits all kind of you know theory is not going to work when it comes to injury prediction, right? So uh, uh, the idea that I think even this paper even reinforces the idea that we are trying to pursue that we have to look at from the uh, bottom up approach, right? And and look at the brain tissue, uh, brain injury risk from uh, the smallest scale possible, and then uh, try to uncover all the possibilities so that we can have a comprehensive you know brain injury prediction. So we started with this idea that, okay, uh, strain is the one that we are going to measure because measuring force uh, is, is, is more difficult than looking at the strain. And also the rate of deformation, the strain rate, right? So our starting uh, uh, category is, okay, there will be a combination of a strain and a strain rate that will lead to no injury. That means that it's safe. And there will be a combination of a strain and a strain rate that is going to be very uh, severe and that will lead to so-called mechanical injury. And by mechanical injury, what we mean is an injury that is manifested just because of the mechanical force or motion, right? But our brain tissue is also uh, 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 heavily involved in uh, chemical reactions, right? So whenever a, a traumatic forces are, are, are experienced, you know, inflammatory response kicks in and that actually releases a lot of chemicals and, and over time, that actually leads to different modalities of injury. So we call it so-called pathway-induced injury. That means 
one a mechanical injury happens, it followed by this pathway level injuries that actually is due to the chemical actions and that actually cause the uh, neural communication or affect the neural communication, okay? And this is kind of uh, 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 takes longer than uh, uh, that the mechanical injury itself and it can take maybe minutes, hours, even days, depending on the severity and the, the, the way the chemical you know, injury happens. So this is our starting point. And then what we do is we try to model the single exon and all of its you know, subcellular elements like the cytoskeletons and, and through computations evaluate their damage mechanisms at different strain rates, right? So uh, as I, I mentioned to you that our, our, our cytoskeleton element has uh, so-called the long fiber-like microtubule, then actin, the neurofilaments, then we have very small uh, proteins, highly stretchable proteins called tau protein that actually in, you know, uh, connects between the microtubules. That's this red fiber-like materials are kind of schematically showing the tau proteins, right? So we want to evaluate the properties of each of those elements. And we do a lot of molecular level computations and this is one way we can see that, uh, of course, it is played very fast, but it shows a fiber-like microtubule can be actually broken apart if the load uh, applied too fast. And also uh, we can actually capture the effect of, you know, a loading rate on the uh, uh, failure or damage of this microtubule. So from our simulations, we found that a typical failure strain is about 15%. Also, of course, through molecular simulation, we can also get the stress measures, but I would focus more on the strain data uh, because the stress, as I said, requires constitutive properties and, and it is still debatable that how you really uh, pinpoint the constitutive properties of the, of the brain tissue. So uh, if we focus on the strain and we can look at different strain rate, then we can, we can have a sense that okay, strain rate has uh, uh, high standard loading of the microtubule actually can lead to uh, failure of this microtubule at about 15%. On the other hand, if we look at the data that is available that uh, actually tested uh, the microtubule at a very low strain rate that shows uh, the failure strain is about 50%. So definitely a distinct dependence on the strain rate and the failure strain, right? So the same way we can, we can capture the properties of, of, uh, of other cytoskeletal elements, but uh, I want to portray the idea that we are trying to build here, right? So we have the, the strain and the strain, strain rate and the strain, and, and then we want to populate the uh, strain strain rate combination that actually leads to injury or, or not injury, that means the damage. And this is how uh, we envision the microtubule behaves. Then if we look at the actin filaments, it is also heavily strain rate dependent and exhibit strain and strain rate you know, uh, dependent failure. And we can also look at how the actin filament, the another cytoskeletal element uh, uh, respond to mechanical forces, right? And you can see that a distinct dependence on strain and strain rate. And we can find out what actually the strain and strain rate combination would lead to the actin filament damage. So other cytoskeletal elements could be measured. I think one important one is the so-called microtubule. And that is, as you can see, the microtubule actually interlinks the microtubule. So this is the cross-section of a single neuron actually taken at the exon level. So all these circles that you can see here represents these microtubules. The microtubules, these microtubules are highly arranged and they're connected through this my, uh, microtubule associated protein called tau protein. So if we look at the deformation that can take place, uh, could be varieties of type, right? One, we already saw what leads to microtubule failure. Another one we can see is what happens is this tau protein uh, associated with the microtubule number one and the tau protein with the number two can separate from each other. This is so-called the tau and tau separation, or this tau protein could be also separated from the junction of the microtubule. So many different ways 
this tau protein can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, broken apart from the microtubule. And so we again did simulations involving a, 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 a you know, representative elements involving uh, two microtubule and this pair of tau protein and did this uh, study and, and found that uh, uh, tau tau separations from each other is, is very much unlikely within the uh, strain that we are, we, are, we are concerned of, right? If you recall, a microtubule failure happens about 15 to 50% strain, but this tau protein can, are so stretchable that they can stretch so long, still they don't really separate uh, from the uh, microtubule or from each other until the strain reaches you know, almost 400%. So uh, uh, in the context of damage probability, uh, tau tau or tau empty separation may not be a, a, a possibility, but one thing is for sure, this protein is highly stretchable and at low strain rate, they will stretch but at high standard, they may not be able to respond so quickly. So the, the, the applications would be, would be different, right? So this is our kind of injury risk curve for the cytoskeletal elements. We have taken into account all the major cytoskeletal elements and map out their failure and strain rate combination that leads to damage. So we then incorporate those attributes in a, in a, a simple, a mechanistic model using shell lags and try in involving microtubule and tau protein all of the viscoelastic materials and try to predict a, 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 a kind of injury risk curve for single exon. And you can see that we have uh, the strain rate as one measure. And then we have uh, the uh, uh, length over the critical length, which is a measure of strain in a sense. And we can find out what combination of this strain and strain rate will lead to uh, failure. And, and we have found two different modalities, right? One is the uh, possibility of microtubule failure. Another is the uh, uh, kind of uh, stretching of this uh, tau protein that doesn't lead to failure. And that way we can uh, competitionally predict the uh, uh, kind of failure of single exam. Now, uh, definitely uh, computations is great, but until we have any validation, uh, we, we just uh, can't you know, feel confident that how we are predicting, right? So I think we have a very great team uh, that we are collaborating with, uh, with a team called Panther. It is a, a team based in uh, you know, the Wisconsin. And, and uh, as a whole, we take a look into the uh, injury of the brain tissue at all levels, right? And then uh, for my cellular level, I think uh, I I'm doing collaborative experiments with uh, Dr. Christian Frank in, in Wisconsin Medicine and then uh, Dr. Diane Hartman team in, in Brown. And they look at the neuron cell that is cultured in the lab in a petri dish and then subject them to uh, strain and I think strain rate that we, we are kind of uh, looking at and try to find out what leads to the cell there. So uh, we of course have not been able to pinpoint uh, or match exactly what we are doing the same data with theirs because the experiment is still ongoing, but we are very hopeful by end of this summer, we will have some meaningful data. Uh, but uh, based on what we have so far, uh, this is uh, the, the whole, whole Panther team. I think you can go to the website, uh, it's Panther in Wisconsin, if you search, you'll be able to find it. It's a very impressive group of people uh, that involves, you know, uh, uh, even uh, the team ONB that is actually make one of the leading uh, military helmet producer. Uh, this is Christian Frank. He is the uh, team lead and, and, and uh, faculty and, and a scientist from the national labs and different institutions. Uh, so we, we collectively work together to uh, serve the same mission, how to uh, predict uh, the so-called the TBI injury risk. Right, and this is what we have so far. So again, the strain and strain rate that uh, you know provides the collect some collection of data uh, from our study and, and a study done by others to point out what a strain and strain rate combination would lead to cellular level uh, uh, understanding of the brain injury. Okay, so. So far, we focused that our, our recent progress uh, of the mechanical level injury. And I want to spend some time, not maybe the next five minutes, I'm going to spend on some of our progress towards uh, you know, pathway in this injury. So the pathway in this injury, as I mentioned, involves neural communication because 
uh, when mechanical injury happens, the extra, you know, cellular uh, uh, level uh, chemical being released, that actually hampers how the neurons communicate with each other and eventually involve the brain rhythm. And that's how we can somehow uh, quantify this kind of pathway in this injury in a way by tracking whether the neuron is responsive or not, right? Of course, there are other ways it can be done, but this is one of the ways we can uh, have some understanding uh, of, of subcellular level injury prediction due to uh, factors other than you know, mechanical directly, right? So talking about how uh, our, our brain communicates, I think we all know about brain rhythms and there are uh, varieties of you know, frequencies uh, the brain actually in, uh, exhibit the, the waves and it's classified as beta, alpha, theta, and delta. And of course, depending on what we do, whether we sleep or stay very alert, the frequency changes. And, and the way we can actually capture these brain rhythms also depending on what detail you are looking at, right? At the macroscopic scale, if we want to uh, sense how the overall brain is being uh, kind of uh, behaving, uh, then we, we are talking about capturing a collective information uh, and the, the modality that you can use is so-called EEG. Uh, we can put a place of, you know, uh, set up set up uh, probes on the skull and then uh, involving some targeted study, we can see the overall activity of the brain uh, tissue, right? And at the microscopic level, that means if we want to really localize and pinpoint what's going on, then uh, a, a, a surgery has to be done. You, we need to make the skull open and then uh, you need to uh, place some implant and then you can actually uh, detect some of the and localized activity of the neuron signal communication, right? Of course, if you want to study how a very few number of you know, neurons are, are kind of behaving or whether they're communicating well, you have to do so-called patch clamp experiment. And what it does is it basically study the uh, uh, reduction potential or the uh, basically electric, electrical signal being uh, passed at, along the exon fiber, okay? So in a very, I think, simple term, we can say our, our neuron cell is nothing but an electrical circuit. And it behaves exactly like the way a electrical signal being passed. We, uh, we have to have a potential difference being created across the neuron fibers, okay? And this potential difference will lead to current flow because our neuron fiber has collectively show some resistance, right? This is V equal to IR. This is the fundamental uh, ways the, the neuron actually communicates, right? And now the potential itself actually is a variable that is varied due to chemical activities across and, 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 and because of the you know, ionic potential changes as they actually goes in and out of the neuron cells to the medium outside of the neuron cells, right? So the potential is changes due to neural uh, chemical changes and that leads to neural communication. So as I was saying, when mechanical injury happens, this potential changes because of this uh, uh, inflammatory response, right? And one of the, I think, uh, uh, inflammatory response that happens, we can track down is so-called exonal swelling, right? The swelling, as you can see, is basically uh, uh, increasing the volume in a certain location of the neuron cell because of injury, right? And, and this swelling needs localized a, a kind of volume change that a, a bump forms within the neuron cell. And what we want to study that what level of injury can really disrupt the neural communication, right? So this is in a way a, a very subtle, but in a way connect the pathway level injury uh, from the cellular level. So the way we model is, is this, we model a, a single uh, healthy exon is a long cylinder and all the detail uh, uh, structure is basically electrical model is done uh, using so-called uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model. And we created another uh, uh, system where we put artificially created a soil region, right? So our parameters are the radius of the exon and the radius of the soil region and that's a variable and we study uh, by varying the exon radius and the soil radius by 30 times. And we want to see 
for a given exon radius and soiling radius combination, what really happens, right? So we capture the entire, not entire, but the significant area of the uh, uh, neuron cell and how the electrical communication happens, right? So we, we started from here, the zone A, pass this electrical signal, and then we want to see when it reaches this uh, soil region, as it transmits, can it really go to the next region, right? So if it pass this, you know, without any problem, then we can say that even though there is some uh, swelling, the exon, uh, I mean, exon, the neuron will be still communicating, right? So this is kind of what we wanted to capture. And this is a, a case where we have the swelling is, is, you can see that the signal is being the uh, spike train is traveling and successfully, you know, go, went to the next one without any problem, although we have a, a significant swelling, right? Now, another case, if we want to see now, now the swelling is even higher. The spike train is, is passing to the zone A, the left zone. As it is going, to, trying to go through, you can see that the swelling is too severe that is not going to travel anymore. So that means the communication is being disrupted, right? So collectively, we can now pinpoint for a, for a given soiling radius and for exon radius, because those are different from different subjects, can we identify a combination where the neuron signal is still communicating and when it is not, right? So this, is, this gives us a kind of an, a perspective that there are certain conditions where swelling actually is, is problematic, right? Uh, uh, and this is what we have done so far. We're now trying to relate what level of head motion will create this kind of you know, swelling. So the, this relation is still not known precisely. So I think this is something uh, we should be able to get some better results in the coming days, right? So uh, in the last two, or two minutes, maybe I would like to say what uh, we are doing next. So we, we are capturing the so-called action potential or how neuron communicates within itself. So that's one of the neurons, how they communicate. I think through models, we can capture it. And there are, uh, you know, um, as I said, uh, experiment that you can do at that level is so-called uh, uh, patch clamp study. Now, our, our, our brain tissue has 120 billion of neurons on that ballpark, right? So, and, and also they're highly, uh, uh, I would say random in terms of their uh, uh, orientation. And orientation does matter when it comes to action potential communications, right? Because uh, one goes left to right, another goes right to left. If, if, we, if we interact them together as the circuit works, it, 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 will, it will show nothing is being communicated, right? Uh, co uh, collectively. And that is the reason if we look at uh, the EEG signal, that is not, that is actually a summation of all the 120 billion of action potential that you are being uh, uh, <clears throat> that is happening within the brain in a sense, but because of this cancellation, you actually only get a part of it, right? So EEG is the macroscopic measure and the action potential is a very, very cellular level measure. And how do you connect them is a big mystery. And, and so what we are trying to do is we're trying to create an environment in the lab without involving any human subject to uh, create artificially the, the signals uh, that can be readable by the EEG and signals that can be readable by the uh, you know uh, single neuron and try to uh, develop a, a computational model to relate these two. And uh, uh, on the side, as I was, I was uh, uh, talking to Kate this earlier this morning, that we are also building experiments to not only understand the brain injury motion and the corresponding you know, stream deformation that is being produced inside more uh, comprehensive manner through experiments, we're also uh, uh, making some progress to understand how the, uh, the brain can be, or the head could be protected, right? So try to des design some advanced materials uh, as a protective layer to understand how the brain, um, the advanced helmet materials could be designed so that they can really prevent injury more, right? 
So I think uh, in a nutshell, this is what uh, I talked today, uh, how uh, the cellular level injury can happen within the brain and also the electrochemical injury, so-called the patho injury can happen. And of course, uh, we, we have not really figured out yet. It's a long road ahead. We have just done a very part of it uh, uh, at the cellular level, but we're making, making progress, I think, every day. And hopefully in, in, in the coming days, we'll have some uh, better understanding how really injury happens within the brain. So uh, some of the, as I said, uh, we are actually uh, transitioning more towards more experiments, uh, try to uh, also transitioning to understand, not transitioning, but expanding our capabilities to not only understand how injury happens, but also how we can present it using uh, some advanced material design, using 3D printing, and also capturing the dynamics at high speed. Uh, so this is kind of our vision in the coming days, right? So use 3D printing and high speed dynamics and our computations to uh, relate uh, the head injury criteria with brain injury criteria and, and so-called tissue injury criteria in a way to understand uh, all the linkage. Uh, of course, uh, this is my group. Uh, they have done all the work and I'm just presenting. Uh, uh, so we have, uh, you know, I think students and, and, and all maturity level, we have postdocs, uh, PhD students, uh, undergrad students and master's level students. And, and of course we have uh, two, uh, uh, you know, PhDs uh, just left us uh, for their uh, next career move uh, uh, who are heavily involved in this research. So I think uh, these are just a list of some of my papers. If any of you have interest, please let me know. I would be happy to uh, send it. Uh, finally, I must thank uh, our funding agencies to support our research and the Panther collaboration. That's really uh, very helpful. And, and, and some of the collaborators who are more directly involved in this project. I think uh, uh, that's it. Uh, I, I, I took a little longer than what I, I thought, but I appreciate it uh, for your time listening to me and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Yeah, that's a great talk. Um, do you have any questions for Dr. Adi? Okay. Um, any, any questions? Hi, Jai. Can I can I have a question here? Sure. Hi, Dr. Adam. How are yeah. you? Hi, good. Yeah. So, uh, so for the experiment, uh, I'm I'm trying to think about right. So to validate all these uh, your model and also your data, uh, your metadata, data. Uh, how how you guys do the experiment? Because this TBI right. So it's um, what what kind of uh, experiment you guys have done? You know to 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 validate this uh, your results there? Yeah, a very, very good question. And that's a very challenging experiment. I think, you know, there are experiments being done at different levels, okay? Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, there are experiments being done uh, by creating, a, let's say, simplistic head model and filled with, you know, uh, maybe gelatin gel or some kind of, you know, soft materials. And, and then you subject them to uh, motion uh, related to uh, what leads to injury, right? So, you, you know, you can put an acceleration sensor and mm -hmm. then also, uh, you know, insert some pressure sensor to relate this acceleration and pressure, right? This is kind of a macroscopic measurement. I think that is being done uh, in my many groups. Uh, I, through my collaborations, I know, you know, David Camarillo in, in uh, Stanford, he actually using uh, this kind of technology to uh, using his mouth guard, right? So he actually have the uh, the helmet, and he has actually a sensor placed in, in near, the, near the mouth. That's why they call it mouth guard. And then he can capture all these motions, right? So that is an experiment, I would say, in the macroscopic scale. Yes. What we are trying to do is the simi applying similar motion, but want to see a little bit at the cellular level, right? Yes. So as I was also talking to you know Kate this earlier this morning that. Um, uh, there are groups who can actually do experiment at the cellular level. For example, uh, Christian Frank and, and Diane Hoffman team, their group, uh, are many others maybe, but that two, that two of them I know. What they do is they, 
they actually culture they actually culture neuron cells on a small let's say petri dish and then they actually impact them or maybe place them in the shock tube right even the Na naval research lab they do the same thing uh, at this that i know of uh, and and study what combination of repetition of load or, or, or acceleration will lead to cell death okay so what we are doing something of similar in nature but involving uh, i would say more realistic head mode so uh, if you look at this picture right this is of course a cartoon i don't know if i have okay maybe i do not have the real phantom head so this is so called the phantom head architecture okay so this has all the anatomic detail of the hoop whole human head including the skull the skin the tissue and everything so we actually custom build this and all the vascularities everything is there so we have some actually chamber where we are we have the room to place the culture neural cell so as we impact the head we have the acceleration sensor outside uh, to to capture the motion we have pressure sensor to capture the you know pressure inside and then we can also see what leads to cell death sounds great thank you yeah, I got a little more question maybe during our meeting. <laughs> Thank okay, you. No problem. We're meeting yeah. at three, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's See a very you. great question. See you. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. I actually have a follow on maybe a comment. Uh, so you're talking about this characterization. The sensors are certainly going to be very important, right? You're probably aware of uh, in recent years, there has been. Uh, a lot of attention on something called the soft uh, wearable electronics. It, it's a different from the wearables we have, like, like Apple watches and so on. Those we don't call them really soft devices, okay? But people like John Rogers and many other people now doing this. So it's very soft. You can have a kind of formal contact with the exactly. skin, right? For instance, you could have uh, sensors like EEG sensors, right? Well, right now you put this uh, electrode, but relatively rigid. You put it like, in, but the, you could have something can formally wrap around the head. Okay, some very soft sensors, okay, uh, you could, could do this. And then you, you mentioned about a, a mouse guard. So it is possible to embed the sensors in the, in the mouse guard, okay? So essentially it doesn't change the mechanical properties of the mouse guard at all, but uh, you, you extract the, the electrical properties. So I think uh, it, it seems the sensors uh, could have potential, right? Uh, could be oh, absolutely, I think, in, you know, uh, there are a lot of uh, possibilities, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that you brought this up. This, you know, soft, uh, you know, I think electronics has a bright future. I have no, no doubt in my mind. And I think uh, implementing the sensor is one challenge. And, and, and our brain, sig you know, brain signal itself is so, I would, I would say, you know, noisy to get, in, to get the right information. It's a very, very big challenge. I think people spend a life just doing EEG, try to capture how to, you know, interpret the brain signals, okay? And, and uh, my understanding is, I am very limited in, in knowledge in how EEG works, but my understanding is as I talk to Sparks, it is very much, you know, human skill dependent still to really pinpoint how you really pinpoint the EEG signal and the corresponding meaning, right? Exactly. Oh. Yeah, no, it's sort of an art, right? Because you, you're absolutely yeah. right. Well, people know a lot about uh, ECG, about the heart activities, yeah. right? There. Well, we learned a little bit because we are involved a little bit of that uh, study. Yeah. So we learned a little yeah. bit how to, but that's very complicated. But EEG is even much more complicated. But I think part of the problem is uh, what can be uh, maybe alleviated is actually by the technological advances. So you can, if you Absolutely. get better sensors, actually you may get a more accurate data because a lot of this is noises, okay? Let's say for, if you move, right, you cut something called the motion artifacts, that can, I mean, because the yeah, data Absolutely, is already... I think, you know, the soft electronics and, and, and the recent surge in, in machine learning, exactly. both of them are heavily applicable exactly. to, to, to take it to the next level. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the wearable sensors have been used mostly for, let's say, for health applications, right, for different diseases. But I think for TBI, I have not seen um, anyone has applied the sensors to, 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 to this work. So that's why, yeah, I just want to bring it up. Um, 
but that's a very good question. I think, you know, uh, strong opportunities. I, I definitely foresee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can talk more about that. When we Absolutely. Get. Maybe a, a simple, uh, sort of a, a naive question is, uh, Let's say uh, what well, the brain tissue is very soft, right? We can think of as soft materials. So typically, let's say from the mechanical point of view, right? If a material, if we load it, let's say especially load a soft material, it's difficult to cause damage as long as it's within the elastic range, right? You can load that back and forth many, many times. So for the brain tissue, let's say if you have a concussion, um, I would imagine that the, the strain is actually relatively small because of this more of a fluid, uh, that type of behavior, right? So the strain involved in the tissue is relatively small. So what is exactly the damage mechanism, right? Well, if just from the material point of view, within the I, 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 That's a very, very good point. I think, let me go to the beginning and uh, uh, yeah. So this is something uh, would give you, uh, I, 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 this could give you some perspective, right? So if you look at the brain tissue, uh, peak strain, I think that this is the first principle strain, is about 50%. So it's not too small. Okay. It, it's large deformation, right? And it says, say it's a soft tissue under large deformation. One, one, one thing is missing here is the uh, you know, uh, effect of uh, let, rate of loading, okay? When you apply high rate, just the same reason it's soft and highly viscoelastic, the response is very localized and could be very different, right? And 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 you know when you look at the brain tissue, uh, just as a, as a as a soft material, a soft homogeneous material, that is one thing. I think we have some understanding how a homogeneous soft viscoelastic material behaves, right? The problem is the brain tissue is also have highly oriented exon fibers. Those are not soft exon fibers have microtubule okay. that has a, you know, elastic modulus is about three gigapascal. That's very stiff, but the also has connected with, you know, tau protein, which has a uh, modulus of elasticity about one kilopascal. And you have a myriad of possibilities, how uh, this thing will respond. But I tell you, you cannot ignore the strain and the strain rate because both of sure. them collectively give you Absolutely. I think in a, in a summary, I think the strain, as you can see, is not really insignificant. Uh, although, uh, uh, and you have, to, you have to get this, in particular when you have rotational motion, right? Rotational motion cause uh, a significant shear deformation because the shear modulus of brain tissue is, as I said, only, only two kilopascal. So you can see very small force can lead to very right. severe deformation. Right. So you're saying is it's still some sort of uh, mechanical damage, right? Essentially is the breaking of at some levels, right? It's uh, because yeah. I was, I, I, I have no idea about this stuff, but I find it fascinating. So is, uh, is it possible to like, you have some, because here you have electrical domain, you have chemistry involved, right? Is it possible to have any like electrical or chemi chemical damages uh, in addition to mechanical damage, but it sounds like a, you think it's still yeah, like it is mechanical definition. Not only possible, that always happens, but statistically, injury always initiated by mechanical injury, and that is very short duration. Let's say you have applied force in time zero, within few seconds, the mechanical injury will happen, right? Because it's immediate, it's a load and the, and the corresponding effect. The, pathway in this injury or the chemical injury is a little bit slow process, right? Injury happens, then, you know, cascade of events are taking place. You have the inflammatory response, chemical being released, and then, you know, your, your, your you know, uh, attributes changes, right? You are, you are very alert. Now you became a little bit, you know, uh, maybe sleepy. So your brain wave, you know, started to show different uh, waveform. Collectively, this brings to a slow event, right? And and, and you have to think about the degree of, let's say, slowness could be exactly depend on the degree of mechanical injury. If the mechanical injury is the borderline of no injury and little injury, then people can do really well. And maybe six months later can show some symptoms. And that is being observed in the military community, in particular, those who are subjected to repeated blast exposure someone is, is coming back from their you know, mission 
six months, nine months later, they're showing some uh, you know, PTSD kind of symptoms. So is it related? It is still to be found, but I think there is enough data to pay some attention. Okay, okay, well, thank you, thank you, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, I think, uh, yeah, already three minutes past 11. So, um, well, let's just stop here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ash, again, for, for the very nice talk. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you so much. And of course, you know, I can be reached anytime offline, no problem. Or I'll be happy to, you know, exchange information or any questions you have. But thank you so much for inviting me. And thanks, everyone, for joining and, and, and for your time. I hope, you, you know, we have some, uh, you know, uh, some learning about what we have been doing. And, and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye.